Honky Tonk is a 1941 western starring Clark Gable, Lana Turner, and Claire Trevor, and was directed by Jack Conway. When con man Candy Johnson tires of being chased out of every town he passes through, he decides to pick one out for himself that he'll never be tossed out of. So, he sets his sights on Yellow Creek, Nevada, and goes about becoming its leading citizen by any means necessary. Honky Tonk is another movie that I went into having very little idea what to expect. The plot synopsis provided on Warner Archives DVD is not that helpful. But I knew three things. Clark Gable, Western, and involves a con man. Now Westerns, obviously that's got me excited already. Clark Gable, while he only made a handful of Westerns in his career, I've enjoyed the ones I've seen, and I always find him an interesting personality, and very often quite a good actor. And con men, I really enjoy films focusing on the art of the flimflam man. While that can lead to nearly cheering on a criminal, I do enjoy those occasions where the con men use those skills for good helping others by employing extremely elaborate schemes that depend on their marks doing exactly what they predicted they would. The TV show Leverage is one example, and the original Mission Impossible series is perhaps the ultimate one. But instead, Honky Tonk really turned out to be something of a Western version of The Godfather. Before anyone thinks I'm about to laud Honky Tonk as a forgotten treasure that belongs on every greatest of all time list, right alongside Francis Ford Coppola's epic, I won't go that far. What I mean by making that comparison is that Honky Tonk tells the story of a man that goes from fairly humble beginnings, even if Candy Johnson is by no means a humble man, and then begins acquiring power, developing a wide-ranging enterprise of organized crime, and eventually leads to tearing apart his family and alienating his wife. When the movie began to go in that direction, I was completely surprised, and gives the movie a much more expansive feel than I had anticipated. When Candy Johnson arrives in Yellow Creek, it is barely more than a tent city, in the middle of a boom due to local mining operations. By the end of the movie, it is a thriving metropolis of the West, complete with a gigantic mansion in which Candy Johnson resides. That being said, the tone is fairly uneven, which contributed to my being caught off guard by how dark the story gets. Early on, the movie had a fair bit of light comedy, as we're introduced to Johnson, as played by Clark Gable, and his partner Sniper, played by Chill Wills. The movie opens with them about to be literally tarred and feathered, and Clark Gable is given a fantastic introduction, using his talents for sleight of hand and his silver tongue to turn an angry mob into an attentive audience before he and Sniper make their escape. Clark Gable is very good in the role, and particularly in that scene, he's very impressive. While I'm sure the actual card tricks are performed by a double, he's able to tear through an incredible amount of dialogue while playing off the actors making up his potential torturers. As the film progresses, it becomes harder to tell what exactly is driving this man. Once in Yellow Creek, he becomes the resident philanthropist, paying for a church to be built while at the same time opening the one supposedly honest saloon in town, given the name the Square Deal Saloon, after confronting and besting the corrupt sheriff who runs the most crooked saloon around. But is he doing these things because he's truly trying to turn his life around, or are his motivations far more sinister? The question hangs in the air for quite some time until the moment when we see him giving his orders to the new mayor and sheriff he's had elected and doing business with the very man who he exposed for his corruption, played by a quite young and very dastardly Albert Decker. After that scene, there is no second guessing about what his intentions are. But Clark Gable plays all of these various iterations of Candy Johnson with so much skill, and it's thanks to him that the tonal shifts don't seem as jarring as they otherwise could. He's good as the tough man who's seen too much in the towns he's fleeced, never leaving his house without a gun. He's smooth and charming when meeting with the governor of Nevada and doing deals with all manner of highly connected people. He's cold and ruthless as the backroom negotiations that typify his criminal operations play out. And he can also play light romantic comedy when he's confronted with the affections of both leading ladies, even if his oft-imitated squinted eyes and pursed lips are on overdrive in his scenes with Lana Turner. Lana Turner plays the Boston-born woman who is new to the West that ends up marrying him when he's in no condition to object. Lana Turner is quite good in the film, even if she looks far too young to be Clark Gable's love interest. That shouldn't be a shock, considering the disparity in ages for screen couples that has pervaded throughout film history, but it still feels odd. Her character, too, is very hard to read, up until a certain point. She seems so naive and desperate to ignore the warning she's given regarding Candy Johnson's lack of commitment, until it becomes obvious that she's married him in order to change him, which is always a great idea for a woman to do when smitten with a stereotypical bad boy. I can't decide whether it's the script or her performance that is to blame, 
but this aspect of her character isn't explored nearly as much as I think it should have been. Rather than fighting to quell his more criminal tendencies, she instead just settles into their new lifestyle of being extraordinarily rich, apparently never questioning how it is they can afford all of this while still being honest. There are some more tragic circumstances that befall her character later in the movie, and I thought during those scenes she was very good. And I won't get into specifics of what happens, but she ends up looking quite drained, wearing little makeup with her hair askew, and for Lana Turner, that really impressed me. I've read John Wayne's complaints of her never allowing her makeup to be disturbed during the making of the sea chase, so her willingness to look slightly less glamorous was admirable, even if it was probably just mandated by MGM, her not having the same degree of star power she would in a few years. Frank Morgan is excellent, playing Lana Turner's father, who is also an aging grifter masquerading as the upstanding judge of Yellow Creek. Frank Morgan is an actor that never fails to impress me, and he's part of several movies I love, the first being his role as Mr. Matichek in The Shop Around the Corner, and of course, the titular Wizard of Oz. Here, he also is able to navigate the varying tones of the movie wonderfully. To start off, he's the jovial con man, happy to be slipping under the radar and pleased to see his old friend Candy Johnson, even if he doesn't want his daughter to find out about what his true occupation is. But later, he's given the most complete and even moving character arc in the film, as he tries, even if it's futile, to save his daughter as he watches her being corrupted by her husband. The scenes as he's pleading with his daughter upon learning of the marriage are really great, and then later, having sunk into alcoholism while living under the same roof as the man he's nearly come to hate. Claire Trevor plays the bad girl of the film, an old friend of Johnson's that ends up working at his new saloon. This isn't exactly a stretch for her to play, as she's probably best remembered for her work in Stagecoach, playing a not dissimilar sort of character, although in Stagecoach she's given much more to do. Here, her main role is to be jealous of Lana Turner and really deliver the speech that drives Lana Turner towards the very misguided and impulsive marriage. That being said, she's very good. She can play a world-weary and hard-bitten woman with an air of carelessness, which is very intentional, but she is given a turning-over-a-new-leaf aspect to her later on, which I appreciate. And she does all of this under a series of increasingly elaborate and unwieldy hats. Marjorie Maine is fun as a boarding house owner who also is able to rally the townsfolk and stir their consciences when needed. I probably said a similar thing when discussing Percy Kilbride in Fallen Angel a few months back, but when I hear her voice, it makes me feel like I'm a little kid again. I watched the Mon Pa Kettle series so many times growing up, and seeing her and listening to her just transports me back. And we even get the visual of her standing on a front porch with a double-barreled shotgun, something it seems she was born to do. Chill Wills I've already mentioned, and he's also not given a lot to do, despite being on screen a fair bit as Candy's sidekick. His folksy shtick is quite entertaining, though, and I enjoyed his running gambit of sidling up to a table of poker players, appearing to be a novice, just before absconding with most of their money. The movie was directed by Jack Conway, who worked with Clark Gable a number of times, including in Boomtown and The Hucksters later on, and he does quite a good job of keeping the story moving and allowing the movie to focus on the character dynamics, even if their motivations are a little murky at times. The screenplay was by the husband and wife team of Marguerite Roberts and John Sanford. Marguerite Roberts, of course, wrote the screenplay for True Grit, 28 years later, which brought John Wayne his only Oscar. Their script here is, as I said earlier, a surprise due to the scope it takes, and builds the ongoing corruption of Candy Johnson and those in his orbit very carefully and believably. And the entire time, I thought we were building towards this great, redemptive arc for Johnson, where he's going to be confronted with his sins and work to restore some law and order in the town. Before I continue, if you have not seen Honky Tonk and don't want to spoil for you, please jump to the time code below. I realize spoiler warnings for an 82-year-old movie might seem a little goofy, but I wouldn't want it spoiled for me. Now where was I? Oh yeah, that great moment when Candy turns things around isn't quite as satisfying as it should have been. Let me set the stage for you. He has everything. Money, a loving wife, a baby on the way, and then three things happen. His father-in-law is murdered while preparing to expose the truth about Johnson, his wife loses the baby, and the town of Yellow Creek decides it's had enough of the crime lords making off with all their tax money, and it's ready to revolt. And Johnson straps on his gun, goes down and kills Albert Decker, the main instigator of the current trouble, and the killer of Frank Morgan. So far, so good. Johnson then goes into full con man mode, utilizing his gift for gab, and manages to convince the rest of his mob to run for the hills, taking them from a room full of gun-toting outlaws to scared fugitives in a matter of minutes. 
That I really liked. I had hoped they would bookend the movie with his showmanship and using his skill for manipulation to first escape a posse of irate men in the opening scene, and then using it to save the town of Yellow Creek at the end. Which he did. But I never got the sense that he had reformed in any way. I suppose he doesn't really benefit from saving the town, so that could be seen as some form of selflessness. But when he strides out of the city hall, sneers and calls the incensed vigilante suckers, it rubbed me the wrong way. And then we cut to he and Sniper hanging out in yet another hotel in yet another new town, having abandoned his wife. She seeks him out. He asks her, you've liked me the way I always have been and you don't want me to change, right? And she says, yes, Candyman, and we fade out. And I was less than thrilled. Frank Morgan warned her that she would be changed by Johnson, and she would never succeed in changing him. And in the closing moments of the movie, it seems he was right. You could argue Candy left her because he was only ruining her life, but it's not like he went into solitude to atone for his actions. He and Sniper are back on the grifting circuit, and now his wife has joined him. I was kind of shocked. I thought the moral bar that movies of the era had to clear would have imposed a different ending, but somehow it squeaked by with this. Getting back to my Godfather comparison, the first film ends on a really tragic note, with Michael and his wife still together, but at the same time, farther apart than ever. This one is going for a lighthearted ending, but it really didn't work for me. For a Western, Honky Tonk is a very studio-bound film, with much of it taking place on expansive sets, be that the Square Deal Saloon, the Boarding House, or the Johnson Mansion later on. That wasn't a shock to me. MGM tended to keep its more expensive films, Western or otherwise, away from the great outdoors. But that worked for this one. It's a very town-based story, so we aren't subjected to a lot of paper mache rocks and painted backdrops, which is nice. Since it was made in 1941, it did make me wonder if there was some real-world commentary to be found in this story, seeing as it focuses on a man with sinister intentions enchanting a whole community, seeming to better their lives while really only enriching himself. Whether that was intended to parallel events in Europe at the time, or if it was aimed at politicians in general, I'm not sure, but it's something to think about. Either way, the movie was very popular at the time, becoming the second highest grossing movie of the year, coming in behind Sergeant York. Since then, I feel like this movie has fallen into obscurity somewhat, and I think that's too bad. It isn't a perfect film, and the last act does leave a lot to be desired, but it's a very interesting story with a great cast. If you've never seen it, I'd recommend checking out Honky Tonk. Thanks so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this, I hope you consider checking out some more of my reviews on Hildebrand Productions. Thanks again, and until next time, adios for now.